Good morning. It's great to see you all here. Um, my name is Dr. Beth Felker-Jones, and I teach theology here at Wheaton College. And it is my honor this morning to introduce two of my colleagues who will give our first two papers this morning. Um, let me encourage you to uh, think about tweeting the conference at hashtag WTC14. I'm just going to nod at that. Um, <laughs> If you know what that means, then, then you can do it. Uh, and to welcome our excellent presenters this morning. Uh, I'm going to introduce both of them, and then they will speak back to back, followed by a time of questions and answers, which I'll moderate. Uh, please think about questions you might have for either Dr. Lee or for Dr. Richter, or for both, uh, and they'll be happy to take those questions when they're done with the presentations. First, we will hear from Dr. Sandra Richter, professor of Old Testament, Dr. Richter holds the MA from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and the PhD from Harvard University. And she taught at Asbury Theological Seminary and Wesley Biblical Seminary before joining the faculty here at Wheaton College in 2013. We're delighted to have her. Currently, she is working on a commentary on Deuteronomy for Erdman's Two Horizons series and an introduction to the Bible for Oxford University Press. She is the author of The Epic of Eden, A Christian Entry into the Old Testament with Inner Varsity Press, a great book, I highly recommend. Dr. Richter is a popular speaker in both academic and lay venues, and she will speak this morning on the spirit in scripture. Following Dr. Richter's presentation, we will hear from Dr. Gregory Lee, who joined the faculty of Wheaton College as assistant professor of theology in 2011. Dr. Lee works at the intersection of early Christian studies and constructive theology. He holds the MDiv from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and the PhD from Duke University. He co-edited the IVP book, Christian Political Witness, and is the author of the forthcoming Today When You Hear His Voice, Scripture, the Covenants, and the People of God. Dr. Lee is currently working on a project on Augustine's understanding of sin to be titled Sin and Sectarianism. And Dr. Lee will speak this morning on the spirit and the early church. Please welcome both of our presenters this morning. Good morning. I would like to welcome my 8.30 a.m. OT Lytton Interp class and thank them for the coughing. Yes, indeed. All right. Jenny Simmons, the lead singer for the band Addison Road, has a song entitled, What Do I Know of Holy? So what do I know of you who spoke me into motion? Where have I even stood but the shore along your ocean? Are you fire? Are you fury? Are you sacred? Are you beautiful? So what do I know of you? What do I know of holy? Approaching this paper, I feel much the same. What do I know of holy? A pile of degrees in Bible, theology, and the Near Eastern languages and civilizations of the Hebrew Bible, decades in the classroom, but what do I actually know of holy? Our gathering here these two days is dedicated to this question. Who is God, the Holy Spirit? Who is this oft-misunderstood, easily forgotten agency that hurled the cosmos into being? moved upon the waters and infilled humanity with that undefinable essence that makes us image as opposed to simply animate. That thunderous force that rested upon Mount Sinai in fire and storm, that indiscernible energy that inhabited the temple and gave voice to the prophets. That one, God himself, who called a prophet from Babylon, revealed to him the future of his nation, dead and lifeless, slaughtered on the field of battle, slain by their own rebellion, and asked him, son of man, can these bones live? And then made good his promise when the descendants of that nation gathered in an upper room on the day of Pentecost and in response to the resurrection of the crucified Christ were filled with a quality of life and a supernatural agency of which they had only dreamed. This is the one who, when the days of this age come to a close, will invade our fallen dimension with his all-consuming fire, and a new heaven and a new earth will emerge in which there will be no temple, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord Holy Spirit as the waters cover the sea. So who is this Holy Spirit? What does he do and why? 
And where might his hand be discerned in our scriptures? Obviously, these are enormous questions, for indeed, the goal of redemption, the means of redemption, and the evidence of redemption all fall under the agents of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so I am grateful that my task is not to answer all of these questions, but to lay a biblical foundation for the answering to come. And as of all biblical theology starts in Eden, let us begin at the beginning and at the foundation of all we believe. We are first introduced to our leading character in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, tohu vabohu. Darkness was upon the primordial deep, and the Ruach Elohim, that is the Spirit of God, was moving, hovering, brooding, poised like a bird of prey about to strike, marachefet, over the face of the waters. And then God spoke. Meredith Klein sees here in the Ruach Elohim the archetypal theophanic glory of God, the Holy Spirit. That particular manifestation of the Holy Spirit who, quote, makes the clouds his chariot and moves on the wings of the wind. The vocabulary of this first reference makes it crystal clear that the Ruach Elohim is the same God who, having found his people Israel wandering in the howling waste of the wilderness, identified in Deuteronomy as the Tohu, hovers over his fledgling people until that exact moment when they are birthed as the people of God. And then he spreads his wings and carries them into the promised land. Here we see the redundant and glorious plan of God. Once there was nothing, but now you have become the people of God. The kingdom is birthed out of chaos. Quoting Klein, seen by the natural eye, the Ruach Elohim was a heavenly phenomenon of light and clouds, expressed as light, as a fire or the sun, the light of divine glory that no man can approach. Klein would argue that this is the same cloud that, quote, at the beginning of the new creation, at the baptism of Jesus, once again hovered over the waters and then descended in avian form on the wings of the wind, testifying that the one who hurled the stars into place now stood among humanity, clothed in flesh, poised once again to strike at the chaos of our fallen world in order to bring life out of death, light out of darkness, and set bounds to the waters of death. And who says an Orthodox Presbyterian Westminster Calvinist cannot speak with the intonations of a poet? <laughs> Here is God the Holy Spirit at the dawn of creation, both actor and archetype, power and paradigm. But here also is an echo of the creation myths of the ancient Near East. For indeed, there are several cosmologies that include wind in the creative process. In Enuma Elush, the creation story of Mesopotamia, the great god Anu brought forth and begot the fourfold wind, consigning to its power the leader of the host. He fashioned and stationed the whirlwind. He produced streams to disturb Tiamat. Who is Tiamat? She is the primordial deep of Mesopotamian myth, and it is her battle against Marduk that results in the creation as we now know it the placing of the waters above and the waters below. In Egypt, Amun is the incarnation of the four great winds of the earth, unified for one explosive creative act that separates sky <clears throat> from earth and fertilizes the egg that will become the sun. So in both Egypt and Mesopotamia, wind has a role to play in the great catalyst of creation. So as we circle back to Genesis 1-2 and the Holy Spirit's debut in the text, we find that his presence there seems not as transparent as we had hoped. Rather, our biblical writers have chosen to portray the drama of, create, of the creation event with a broadly recognized cast of characters. But here the roles have been redefined, filled not by the anonymous forces of nature or the embodied titans of the pagan pantheons. Rather, here is the Lord Holy Spirit, standing distinct from his creation, unencumbered by any rival, Lord over the works of his own hands. He is wind, but he is spirit. He is breath, but he is God. Hence, with our first introduction, we are plunged into the essential problem of studying the person of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word ruach has many meanings, some natural, some supernatural. 
which of the hundreds of these references to Ruach as breathes, breath, wind, spirit, mind, capacity, intellect, are actually references to the great God. The phrase Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, occurs only three times in the Hebrew Bible. In these three instances, the Septuagint does indeed translate with the same expression that the New Testament uses for the third person of the Trinity, the Numa Hagion. In these three, we find David praying that God will not take his Holy Spirit from him as he did from Saul, Psalm 51, and the prophet Isaiah speaking of the great days of old when God placed his Holy Spirit in the midst of his people, saving and delivering them in spite of their grieving of the same. Additional transparent references to the Ruach as the third person of the Trinity include the approximately 100 times that the writers speak of the Ruach of God or the Ruach of Yahweh. But there are hundreds more occurrences of Ruach many of which refer to the natural forces of wind and breath, some of which are indeed anthropomorphic references to God and his mighty acts, but many more that have little or nothing to do with the person of the Holy Spirit. So we must be careful. As illegitimate totality transfer, the practice of reading every possible translation of a term into every one of its occurrences is not a method, it's a mistake. And good exegesis demands more than lexicography. In particular, as regards the person of the Holy Spirit, there is a category more important than Ruach, and that is the concept of God's presence among his people. Indeed, the theologians of the Old Testament saw a commonality between the Spirit of God and the face or presence of God. And for the Old Testament saints, the presence was everything. What was the promise? I shall be their God, and they shall be my people, and I will dwell among them. How would he dwell among them? This is the person of the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant. So as we track the person of the Holy Spirit in the grand story of redemption, we will be searching for the Ruach, but more importantly, we'll be searching for the presence of God housed among his people in this fallen world. And so we return to the beginning. In Eden, God's perfect plan was that he would share his perfectly balanced universe with his image bearers. Adam and Eve, here the dimensions of the divine and the human would coexist. The cosmos would be filled with God's presence and humanity would have complete access to that presence in the garden. But with humanity's treasonous choice, Adam and Eve are cast out from the presence and the dimensions of the human and the divine habitation are separated. This great divorce is the most necessary and most grievous effect of the fall. Thus, much of the task of redemption may be summarized in a single objective. Reunite the Almighty with his image bearers. Restore the relationship. Get Adam back into the garden. As redemptive history progresses, a brilliant master plan unfolds. By means of ever-expanding efforts, the opportunity for cohabitation is restored. The first concrete expression of this is the building of the tabernacle. In Exodus 25, 8, God speaks, let them build a sanctuary for me so that I might dwell among them. Hear the heart cry of a father longing for his children. Have them build me a tent like theirs so that I might live among them once again. A holy place. Throughout the ancient Near East, sacred space is a place set aside for the presence of the deity and for worship. Most broadly defined, worship is that activity in which the human and the divine draw near. And sacred space therefore becomes the umphalos of the universe, where for one brief shining moment, cohabitation reoccurs. Hence, with the building of the tabernacle, a beachhead is retaken. For the first time since Eden, God actually lives on earth. But unlike the animated statuary of the ancient Near East, in Israel, God dwells here in the person of the Holy Spirit. I shall be their God, and they shall be my people, and I will dwell among them. But as we all know, in the tabernacle, the presence was housed in the Holy of Holies and therefore was partitioned off from those who would seek to draw near. The increasing sanctification and therefore increasing restriction of the outer court, holy place, and holy of holies clearly communicated 
that only the spiritual elite could enter here. Thus, whereas any clean worshiping Israelite could enter the outer court, only the priests could enter the holy place and only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, and that once per year on the Day of Atonement. This was a day of profound anxiety for the one selected as high priest, and he went through days of ritual cleansing prior to entering God's presence. When he entered, he wore bells. Why? To assure all who listened outside the veil that he had not died in the holy place and that he continued to minister on their behalf. There's a job I want where everyone I know is standing outside the veil, finding out if God has found some unclean impurity within me and struck me dead. The increasing sanctification of the three areas of the tabernacle, the restricted access, the elaborate measures taken for cleansing and atonement, all communicate the same message. The Holy One is here, and anyone who draws near must either be holy or dead. So the irony of the tabernacle is the agony of redemptive history. Let me say that again. The irony of the tabernacle is the agony of redemptive history. By its very form, this structure communicates God's desire for cohabitation. But the increasing restriction of persons communicates the legacy of sin, separation. The typical worshiper never approached the presence. Thus the people of Israel live for generations. The presence lives in their midst, marking them as God's peculiar people and their nation as the kingdom of God. But they can only approach him via an elaborate system of mediation and sacrifice. Any who failed to hear the warning of the cherubim stationed outside the Holy of Holies bore the consequences. And we have all seen Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yet the Holy Spirit continues his work in their midst, as the heroes and leaders of the nation are empowered to serve. We read that individuals are filled with, or anointed by, or somehow have the Spirit come upon them in order that they might accomplish kingdom tasks. The Spirit is placed upon Moses' 70 elders to equip them for their new leadership positions as administrators and educators in Numbers chapter 11. Joshua is filled with the Spirit of wisdom in order to lead in Moses' place. During the period of the judges, when the sons of Israel cried out to Yahweh for deliverance from foreign oppression, foreign oppression that resulted from national sin, the Spirit raises up and equips a series of heroes. In Judges 3, the Spirit was upon Othniel so that he was empowered as a warrior and ongoing national leader. The Spirit clothed Gideon to motivate the recalcitrant northern tribes to battle in Judges 6. And in Judges 11, the Spirit was upon Jephthah to equip him to defeat the Ammonites. In Judges 14 and 15, we'd read the saga of Samson, whom the Spirit first troubled and then invaded, such that he accomplished feats of valor against the Philistines, the enemy of God's people. Interestingly, many of these heroes were already skilled in their areas of expertise, but the Spirit empowered them to take those talents to a new level, a level desperately needed by the kingdom of God in its hour of need. As the narrative continues, we learn that the Spirit invades and possesses first Saul and then David, to equip them for their leadership of his kingdom. In these call narratives, the oil of anointing serves as the physical manifestation that these individuals have indeed been chosen and empowered to serve God's kingdom by his Holy Spirit. As for the prophets, they of all the Old Testament characters could explain to us the work of the Holy Spirit. For Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micaiah, Ben Imlach, Amos, Malachi, Ezekiel, all tell us the same tale. Each, upon their commissioning, was caught up into the royal throne room of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Each one overhears the deliberations of his divine counsel, and each one receives their commission to speak on God's behalf. Indeed, Jeremiah gives voice to Yahweh's lament. If they, i.e. the false prophets, had stood in my counsel, then they would have announced my words to my people. Each one of these was raised up by the power of the Holy Spirit, and as promised in Deuteronomy 18, the word of God was spoken through their mouths. I'm one slide ahead of myself. Isaiah repeatedly speaks of the Spirit being upon the servant. 
such that he is equipped to preach the good news of redemption as well. Ezekiel describes this experience as having the hand of God upon him. Daniel Block describes this experience as both the pressure and the power of the divine will bearing down upon him. Indeed, Ezekiel is picked up and carried off by the Ruach Yahweh on several occasions. Elijah, as well, is caught up in a chariot of fire. Meredith Klein's incarnation of the spirit glory cloud. And Elisha's double portion of the spirit equips him for miraculous acts and prophecy following. Even the foreign prophet, Balaam, speaks of the Ruach of God coming upon him such that he prophesies, and this time he actually tells the truth. Hence, in contrast to what many have concluded over the years, the person of the Holy Spirit is alive and well in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, when someone was appointed to an office of leadership or needed special empowerment to lead, fight, or preach, the Spirit came upon them. And the most common need was empowerment to declare the message of Yahweh. So now, let us turn our sights to the New Testament and ask what these same phenomena might mean there. Although much can be gleaned regarding the ministry of God the Holy Spirit in the synoptics, I will launch with the Gospel of John. For this great theologian bridges the ultimate gap for this old covenant Christian. Have we not spoken of the tabernacle, the embodiment of the agony of redemptive history? By its very form, this structure communicates God's desire for cohabitation, juxtaposed to the legacy of sin, separation. But then comes Jesus. In John 1, verse 14, the incarnate Son of God is introduced as follows. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you hear the gospel writer's message? The presence has returned, but this time, the means of his indwelling among his people is human flesh. And this time, even the most foul may approach him without fear. The deformed, the wicked, the shamed, they may behold the exact representation of his nature. Hebrew 1, verse 3, the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1, 15, with no veil standing between. And rather than being consumed by their exposure to the presence, this time they see and touch and are healed. We could not go to him, so he came to us. Behold, I will be their God and they shall be my people, and I shall dwell among them. But there are only so many people that one Galilean can interact with in the course of three years of ministry. Only so many people who can hear the message be touched by the healing hand. And so the next stage of the plan ensues. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we read of the dramatic event that inaugurates the ministry of the church, the ultimate game changer. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves as they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. If you spend much time in Exodus 40 or 1 Kings 8, the imagery here should be very familiar. In these Old Testament texts, we read that both the tabernacle and the temple had been inaugurated with cloud and fire and wind. These natural elements had served as the hallmarks of God's indwelling. The press release that the presence had taken up residence. God's ruach announced his acceptance and approval of the habitation, habitation fashioned for him by his people with wind and fire. And the book of Acts rehearses these same hallmarks in order to communicate that the living church has now replaced the tabernacle temple of old. Just as those structures had been set apart, sanctified to house the presence, so now the church is being set apart for the same. 1 Corinthians 3, do you not know that you are the temple of God? and that the Spirit, the Ruach of God, dwells within you. 2 Corinthians 6, for we are the temple of the living God. 
Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. We, the church, as a community, are now the temple. What then is our function as the temple's successor? Well, just as in the old covenant, the temple was intended to house the presence, in the new covenant, the church individually and corporately is intended to do the same. For more than a thousand years, the typical worshiper could come no closer than the outer courts of God's dwelling place. The deformed, the sick, the unclean, the alien could not come even that close. But the gift of God in Christ Jesus is that you and I have become the dwelling place of God, the Holy Spirit. The presence, la ruach hayom, from which Adam and Eve were driven, that rested upon Mount Sinai with thunder and storm, that sat enthroned upon the cherubim, now resides in you and I. It is nearly too much to apprehend. Moreover, the temple housed the presence in order to make God available to saint and sinner alike. And here, the Israelite could come knowing that he or she could find God. And the alien, according to 1 Kings 8, could do the same. Ultimately, the temple stood as the testimony to the nations that Israel worshiped Yahweh and he dwelt among them. So too, the church. You and I and we as the church are designed to be that place to which saint and sinner can come and find God. Moreover, our restored lives are God's testimony to the nations that he lives and dwells among us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And whereas the temple was a single building that could exist in only one spot, the church is now an ever-expanding community that is slowly, steadily, bringing the presence to the farthest reaches of this world. This leads us to the culmination of redemptive history, the denouement of the great story. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with humanity. He shall dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be among them. Describing heaven as the new Jerusalem, John says, I saw no temple in it for the Lord God, the almighty and the lamb are its temple. The glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. At the end of all things, God is once again with his people. Access to the presence is restored. Adam has returned to the garden. Redemption has been accomplished. And what of the infilling of the presence so frequently encountered among the officers of Israel's theocracy? In the New Testament, this language is most often encountered in Luke Acts, the history of the early church. As the history opens, we are confronted with the most important character of all, Mary. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God, a second creative act. Zecharias, Elizabeth, and their unborn son, John, will be filled with the Holy Spirit. In each instant, it's as apparent that to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be empowered to declare the word of God. When the converts of the upper room experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the opening chapters of the book of Acts, they too are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to give verbal utterance, much like the elders in the book of Numbers and Saul when he receives his commission. When Peter attempts to explain this phenomena to the multitude gathered in Jerusalem, he too is filled with the Holy Spirit and powerfully delivers the inaugural address of the church. Here he announces the incredible news that in this new covenant, the infilling of the Holy Spirit will be the experience of every believer, regardless of office, rank, gender, or caste. One slide of help of myself. Everyone will have the opportunity to be a living vessel of the Holy Spirit. Everyone will have the opportunity to be a part of the supernatural ministry of this God, the Holy Spirit. And even the most coveted gift of the Old Testament prophecy will be extended to all. The language of infilling continues to be employed throughout the book of Acts. After the dramatic healing of the cripple in the beautiful gate in Acts 3, and the even more dramatic presentation of the gospel, Peter and John, are imprisoned by the ruling class of priests, interrogating them 
the priests demand, by what power or in what name have you done this? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, responds, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands before you in good health. Peter concludes by declaring, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. The only words I can muster in response to this apologetic masterpiece is, Peter, you rock. <laughs> the next paragraph is my favorite part. As they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing, nothing to say in reply. Hence, the evidence that Peter and John had been with Jesus was the presence of the supernatural. Both the supernatural act of healing and the supernatural confidence and authority of their preaching. Acts chapter 4 verse 31 reports that after Peter and John rejoin their compatriots, a prayer meeting results in which everyone is filled with the Holy Spirit so that they all began to speak the word of God with boldness. Similarly, Acts 9 tells us that the soon-to-be apostle Paul must be filled with the Holy Spirit so that he might bear the name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. As predicted, Paul is filled and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the Son of God. Paul is again filled with the Holy Spirit and thereby silences the magician of Salamis by locking his gaze, confronting his lie, and cursing him with temporary blindness. The proconsul sees the authority behind Paul's words and is convinced of the gospel. In each of these contexts, it is the filling of the Holy Spirit that enables the fledgling disciples to preach the word with authority and accompanying signs such that the naysayer is silenced, the seeker is convinced, and the kingdom is advanced. All said, as we look at our scriptures, what do we know of holy? In the beginning, the Lord Holy Spirit served as both actor and archetype, paradigm and power. The biblical writer saw him like a falcon, poised above the primordial deep, trembling with anticipation, waiting for the word to strike and launch the miracle of creation. With the great rebellion, he has been forced to clothe himself in cloud and fire. He is the whirlwind. Yet this catalyst of creation has never ceased his work, ever expanding his influence over this broken world, choosing and equipping his instruments, and by his power, rebuilding the kingdom of God. We stand in what the prophets called the latter days, and that day in which he will at last reinvade our world with his all-consuming fire is closer than it has ever been before. In these last days, the Lord Holy Spirit continues to distribute his gifts to each one individually just as he wills in order to complete his work. He does not always claim the likely, but as the great cloud of witnesses testifies, those who are willing to be claimed will rock their world. And it would seem that if we, new covenant believers, are willing to welcome the ministry of this Holy Spirit, in all of his supernatural self, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Stand with me, if you will, and let's conclude this presentation of the scriptures with the fourth century creed of Epiphanius. Epiphanius, like us, was asking, who is this Lord Holy Spirit? What is orthodoxy? And this is what he came up with. Recite with me. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who spoke in the law and taught by the prophets and descended to the Jordan, spoke by the apostles and lives in the saints, 
Thus we believe in him, that he is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the perfect Spirit, the Spirit paraclete, uncreated, proceeding from the Father, and receiving of the Son, in whom we believe. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 